This is a photo of a posterior synecule. Multiple posterior synecule are seen in the pupil. You can see that those are the areas adhere of the pupil adhering to the lens and they are not dilating. The rest of the pupil has dilated. Such a pupil is also called as a festooned pupil. This is a child who came with blunt trauma, still has condition uh, in the eye. Came when he initially presented, we could not see the anterior segment structures at all because the whole of the anterior chamber was filled with hyphema. As the hyphema resolved, we saw that the patient had a cataract and also the pupil, we have been using dilating drops, is not dilating in one or two areas. And these are the areas of posterior cytokine. In between, there is some amount of blood which is still not resolved. A few more points on anterioritis. Pupillary constriction is an important sign in the differential diagnosis of red eye. In conjunctivitis, it is almost always normal. And in acute congestive glaucoma attack, it is fixed, dilated. Whereas in iridocyclitis, the pupil is small and sluggishly reactive. The risk of pupil block glaucoma exists whenever there is extensive posterior sinusitis. If the posterior sinusitis were to be 360 degrees, then there is a block to the passage of the aqueous, and this can result in iris bombay, and the patient can have severe rise of intraocular pressure and dropping. Iris nodules are characteristic of granulomatous uveitis. The photo below shows plenty of nodules on the iris. In this was a patient with granulomatous uveitis, the cause of which was infection. Intermediate uveitis presents quite differently from anterior uveitis. Pain is not a predominant symptom. Mild discomfort or pain may be present, but the onset is insidious, not acute. And the major complaint is either floaters or diminished vision. Floaters are due to the opacities in the anterior vitreous. If you remember, intermediate uveitis, it is an inflammation in the zone of the pars planar, anterior vitreous, and the basal retina choroidal. So when there is inflammation in this area, the vitreous will definitely have exudates. These exudates could move around and the patient has a sensation of floaters. They can also cause cataract and can cause cystoid macular edema, in which case the patients will have diminished vision. Extensive floater themselves also could cause diminished vision. Now the signs. So as I said, inflammation in the vitreous base, the pars planar, peripheral retina complex. Here there will be exudation of WBCs and they form clumps and those result in signs in the anterior vitreous pars planar peripheral retina and anterior chamber. In order to examine this, you have to use both the slip lamp as well as indirect ophthalmoscopy. These are snowballs in anterior vitreous. Snowballs are nothing but thumbs of an exudates of WBCs in the anterior vitreous. This is especially seen in the inferior retina. Inferior retina, you will see something more interesting, uh, basically in the pars planar region, and this is snow banking. So when all these exudates settle down on the pars planar, they give rise to the appearance of snow banking. These two are extremely specific signs of intermediate uveitis. Peripheral retina may also be involved, and this involvement may come in the form of exudation around its blood vessels, and we call it periphlebitis. Such a lot of exudation and inflammation occurring just in ciliary body and behind the lens, there could be spillover of these cells into the anterior chamber and initial examination of the anterior segment may reveal aqueous cell, flare and capes. But further dilatation and examination of this intermediate zone will give rise to the diagnosis of intermediate uveitis. The spillover anterior uveitis, the spillover of cells into the anterior chamber would occur not only in intermediate uveitis but also in the posterior uveitis.
Posterior uveitis presentation. It becomes more and more painless as you grow posteriorly. Anterior uveitis is a painful condition. Intermediate less so, but choroiditis, for example, hardly any pain, no pain at all, painless condition. Then how does the patient present? He presents with visual disturbances. What are these disturbances? Floaters is one because in posterior uveitis you have the involvement of the retina, the choroid, and the spillover into the vitreous. So the retina, choroid, and vitreous. The vitreous can have opacities, and these opacities will float around, and the patient will have a sensation of floaters. Visual disturbances. There are areas in the choroid or the retina which are inflamed, either one focus or many foci. And what happens here is they are going to disturb the photoreceptors by edema, by separation or by crowding. So the image, when the light which falls on these photoreceptors, because of their disorientation, the image would look distorted. This is metamorphopsia. If there is crowding of photoreceptors, then a normal image would appear larger, macropsia. If there is separation of the photoreceptors, a normal image would appear smaller, micropsy. Any irritation of the photoreceptors is interpreted by the brain as sensation of light. So the inflammation, the irritation can cause photopsia. Finally, blurring of vision. And this is a quite common presentation in posterior uveitis. Blurring of vision, it could be because the foci of inflammation is very close to the macula or it could be because of the dense vitritis or it could be the complications of uveitis including cataract or glaucoma. So the signs are due to the inflammation in choroid or retina or both and we may see this in one single focus or multifocal or diffuse. And the signs are seen in the vitreous, choroid, retina and the optic nerve. These signs are seen both by slit lamp and indirect ophthalmoscopy. The slit lamp examination will take us as far as the anterior vitreous. But the posterior vitreous and the entire retina and choroid need to be seen by indirect ophthalmoscope. Indirect ophthalmoscopy can be done with the instrument indirect ophthalmoscope or with a plus 78 or a plus 90 diopter lens with the slit lamp. What are the signs in the posterior uveitis then? Vitreous will have vitritis. Normally vitreous is clear and the view of the choroid in the retina is unhindered. But if vitreous were to be there, the view is altered. Depending upon the vitritis, one may or may not see the optic disc at all. So vitritis, opacification, exudation, or membranes, or cells and clumps in the vitreous. Choroid. Normal choroid is covered by the retina, but the choroidal vessels are seen and the red of the fundus is because of the choroid itself. In areas of inflammation, yellow-white infiltrates will appear. The retina in front of it will be elevated and may have edema. The retina itself may have infiltrates, so the whole of the retina could be involved and the choroid beneath it would be completely obscured or the retinal vessels may have perivascular cuffing with WBCs, peripherobitis, vasculitis. The optic nerve may be directly involved in the inflammatory process and then we would call it as papillitis. This is a picture of vitritis. The arrow points to a clump of cells in exudation behind the lens. Since it is in the anterior part of the vitreous, the photo has been taken by a slit lamp examination. Thank you. These are the references and my major reference is the Parsons disease of the eye, but the others are including DCSC course or from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the classical book of UVI is with Nassim Black and Duan's Ophthalmology. Thank you.